Hebrews chapter number 13. Hebrews chapter number 13. We're going to read one verse and see how the Lord leads us today. Hebrews 13. And we're looking at verse number 8, please. Hebrews 13, verse 8. A small verse, but my, what truth this verse contains. Hebrews 13, verse number 8. The Bible says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. What a truth. What a reality that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Folks, we're living in a world that's doing nothing but change. Uh, we're, we're different from one day to the next. Outside, inside, physically, emotionally, we're, we're constantly in a process of change. But I'm glad today that there's someone that we can look to, that we can rely upon, and he's always the same. And if you trusted him yesterday, you trust him today, you trust him tomorrow, he'll always be the same. You talk to me yesterday, today, and tomorrow, I may be different all three days. It depends on what I'm going through, what I'm dealing with. I, I may fluctuate, I may go up and down. But I'm glad Jesus Christ is always the same. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I love the book of Hebrews. I love this wonderful book of the Bible. I, I have a hard time deciding what's my favorite book of the Bible. There's about three or four that I circulate as far as my favorite is concerned. Today it's Hebrews because I'm preaching out of it, but uh, next week it might be something else. I love the book of Hebrews. In fact, of all the books in the Bible, and there's a few books that we could say this about, but Hebrews is one of those, book, one of those books of the Bible where the title of the book is so absolutely vitally important to understanding what's being stated in the book. Uh, this is not the book to the Gentiles. This is to the Hebrews. Uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews, I personally believe it is the Apostle Paul. Uh, one of these days I might uh, discuss with you my theory on his writing this wonderful book and all that's involved in it. I think it's more than just simply Paul writing an epistle, uh, but one of these days we may deal with that. But I do believe that the Apostle Paul compiled this and put this together and I think what he's attempting to do, I think, I think the purpose of the book of Hebrews is, is threefold. As far as the audience, as far as the Hebrew people who are receiving it, obviously the book of Hebrews is about exalting Christ. It's, it's showing that Jesus Christ is better. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better, he's better than anything that they knew about in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is just better. However, he's talking to Hebrews. He's speaking to Hebrews. And at the time the book of Hebrews was written uh, in Jerusalem, the temple was still standing. Sacrifices were still being performed. The priests were still bringing blood sacrifices. And in that early church period, those, those Jewish people, they, they had a great tug of war that was taking place. They're looking at that temple standing in Jerusalem. They know about those blood sacrifices. They've been doing that for many, 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 many years. We're talking about a sacrificial system and that Old Testament was more than just simply a religion to the Jewish people. We're talking about their very DNA. We're, we're talking about this is who they are. This is their identity. And now, after a matter of a weekend, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, all of those Old Testament sacrifices have been fulfilled. There's no need to bring a bullock or a goat or a lamb anymore because the perfect sacrifice had been made. Uh, Jesus has risen from the dead. God has confirmed and, and received the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that he made on that cross. And now it is expected of those Jewish people to not perform sacrifices anymore. To not go to the temple with a bullock, with a goat, with a turtle dove or a lamb or anything else. Those days are done. Yet many Jews were still doing that very thing when the book of Hebrews was written. So I believe this book was written to those Hebrew people, first of all, 
to confirm the Jews who were believers in Christ. The book of Hebrews was written to strengthen, to confirm those who had placed, those Jewish people that had genuinely placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Just to strengthen them in their mind and their heart a little bit more that you've chosen Jesus Christ, you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, and that was the right thing to do. But not only to confirm the Jews who were believers in Christ, but this book was written to caution the Jews who were professors of Christ. There were some of these Jewish people, they were only professors. They weren't really possessors. Now, every saved person has a profession. Don't misunderstand me. But there are some people that all they have is a profession. They're not true, genuine believers. So the book of Hebrews was written to them. He talks about neglecting so great a salvation. That's a warning to those professing Jewish people. They weren't true believers. They had had a profession. He tells them in Hebrews 6, if you fall away, if you, if you examine your profession of Christ, but then you look over here at this temple and its sacrifices and you choose to go back to those Old Testament sacrifices and do despite to the Holy Spirit of grace, Hebrews chapter 10. In fact, in Hebrews 10, he says, if we sin willfully after we've come to the knowledge of truth, he's not talking about sinning on purpose. There's, there's been some really terrible preaching out of that verse. They say things like, well, if you sin on purpose, there remains no more sacrifice for your sin. That is not what that verse is talking about. Every Christian that has ever lived has sinned on purpose. Every Christian that has ever lived has walked into a sin knowing it was a sin and did it anyway. But what is that willful sin that's being spoken of in Hebrews 10? That willful sin is those Jewish people willfully having at one time professed Jesus Christ, now they reject him and go back to the Old Testament system. He says, if you do that, there remains no more sacrifice for your sin. You may go back to those Old Testament sacrifices, but they'll do you no good. It's a caution to those Jews who are just professors of Christ. But this book was also written to convert the Jews who were rejectors of Christ. I believe this book was written to win them to Jesus. Look, Jesus is better than what you have. He's better than the Old Testament sacrificial system. And as the Apostle Paul, I believe, is wrapping up this wonderful book of expressing the greatness of Jesus Christ over all those Old Testament sacrifices. By the way, thank God for those Old Testament sacrifices. They were all pictures pointing to the perfect Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We, we praise the Lord for those sacrifices, but those sacrifices could never save your soul from sin in hell. Only Jesus could do so. But as he's wrapping this up and he's, he's giving them some uh, truths here in chapter 13, he says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, the Jesus Christ that you are trusting or the Jesus Christ that you have professed or the Jesus Christ that you are rejecting, he's still the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And forever. See, there was just a few years after the book of Hebrews, the temple was destroyed under the leadership of General Titus. The Romans invaded Israel, surrounded Jerusalem, and ultimately destroyed that temple, and all of the sacrifices with it were gone. Now, I wonder if some of those Jewish people, as they saw their temple crashed to the ground, if you will. Not one stone was left unturned. I wonder if any of those Jewish people recalled the words of Hebrews 13. Jesus the same. Jesus Christ the same. The temple's not the same. It's gone. The sacrificial system's not the same. It's gone. But when the temple came crashing down and the sacrifices were ended, guess who was still here? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I want to preach on that just for a moment today, the changeless Christ. 
The Christ that never changes. The changeless Christ. Notice real quickly in this verse. Notice the name of Christ expressed in this verse. He says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and forever. That name, Jesus, it means Jehovah, just in case you're not aware. It means Jehovah is salvation or Jehovah is Savior. And I'm saying that right. Jehovah is salvation or Jehovah is salvation or Savior. I'm saying that right. Uh, my wife and I, just a few days ago, we were over in Baton Rouge, walking up a sidewalk. Don't recommend that, but we did it anyway. Went up a sidewalk, and these two young men, a young black man and a young white man, came up to us with some literature. I love it when they come to me. It makes, makes it a lot easier. And they came to us with some literature, and uh, they're with the World Wide Missionary Church of God. I think that's what they're called. And they believe in God the Father, but they also believe in God the Mother. They believe in that as well. And they expressed that very quickly. In fact, they talked more about her than they did God the Father. I thought, thought that was interesting. And one of the young men said, you know, there's also this thing called God the Mother. And I, I looked at him and I said, you know, there's not a verse in the Bible that says that. I, I didn't know if they knew that, so I said that. Do you know there's not a verse in the Bible that says that? Not a verse. And they went to Genesis 1, 26, where it says, let us make man in our image. They thought that was God the Father and God the Mother talking. I said, my friend, who was talking in that verse was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And he gave some other verses, and it was all silly nonsense. But they believed it. They believed it. And, and the, the young black guy, he says, he says, he said, do you believe what the Jehovah's Witnesses say? And he said, are, and he asked me, he said, are you a Jehovah's Witness? I said, yes, I am. <laughs> I am a Jehovah's Witness. Because I know who Jehovah is and I witness on his behalf. I can testify that Jesus is Jehovah and Jesus is Savior. Amen. He's Savior. Now, I'm not a JW in the normal sense, but I am a witness of Jehovah because Jesus is salvation. Now, you, so he's, you, you say, well, I, I just don't know if I believe that Jehovah and Jesus are one of the same. I don't, you don't have time to write this down. If you're taking notes, don't try to write this down. But Isaiah 44, 24 calls Jehovah creator. John 1, Colossians 1, called Jesus creator. In Isaiah 8, 13 and 14, Jehovah's called a stone of stumbling. In 1 Peter 2, 6 through 8, Jesus is called a stone of stumbling. In Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. That word Lord, that's Jehovah. Jesus is the shepherd in John 10, 11. In Exodus 15, 26, Jehovah is called the healer. In Matthew 4, 23, Jesus is the healer. In Psalm 139, 1 and 2, in Job 42, 1 and 2, Jehovah knows our thoughts. In Luke 5, verses 22, in Luke 6, 8, Jesus knows our thoughts. In Psalm 50, verse 1 and verse 6, Je Jehovah is judge. And in John 5, 22, Romans 2, 16, 2 Timothy 4, 1, Jesus is the judge. In Isaiah 43, 11, and Joel 2, 32, Jehovah is Savior. Well, Romans 10, 13, Acts 16, 13, and, or 16, 31, and many other verses, Jesus is Savior. The Bible says in Psalm 32, 1 and 2, that Jehovah forgives us of our sins. In Matthew 9, 2, Jesus forgives of sins. Think about this one. In Zechariah 12, 1, you take Zechariah 12, 1 plus verse number 10, in that same passage, Zechariah 12, Jehovah was pierced. In John 19, 34 and 37, as a fulfillment of Zechariah 12, Jesus also was pierced. In Exodus 34, 14, Jehovah was worshipped. And in John 20, 28, Matthew 2, 2, Hebrews 1, 6, and many other places, Jesus is worshipped as well. You say, what are you saying, preacher? Jehovah is Jesus. Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is God. Jesus is Savior. Those, those same two young men we were talking to the other day, they, I, I asked them, I said, tell me how to get to heaven. 
Tell me how to get to heaven. They went through this rigmarole, all these different ideas and thoughts. And one of the last things I, had, I was able to say to them, because that the young black man, he wanted to talk. He would stand there and talk. The, the white guy, he, he got a place where he was staring off into space. He didn't want to talk anymore. But the last thing I told him, I said, fellas, when, as we go, I want to let you know, all these things you you talking about, about how to get to heaven, you're replacing Jesus Christ. Every one of those things replaces Jesus Christ. I said, my prayer is, and one day you realize, Jesus is the only way. There is no other way. There is no other way. Jesus and him alone. And if you're here today and you think there's something else, someone, you'd be surprised how many Baptists think they're going to heaven because they're good. You'd be surprised how many Baptists think they're going to heaven because of the Baptist. Well, you know, my grandpa's buried out there in that Baptist graveyard, so therefore I must be going to heaven. No, my friend, your grandpa may be buried out there, but if you're not saved, you're going to hell. Amen. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. He's the only way out of hell. Jehovah is salvation. Jesus is the only Savior. There is no other way. There is no other way. Jesus Christ, which means Messiah, anointed one, sent one. Jesus was sent into this world to save sinners, to keep us out of hell and get us to heaven. That's the name that is given here in this passage, Jesus Christ. Then the Bible teaches us not only the name of Christ in this verse, but the nature of Christ, the same. I love those two words, the same. He was the same yesterday as he is today, as he will be forever. In theology, this is called the immutability of Christ. It means he cannot change. That Malachi 3, 6 says it like this, For I am the Lord, Jehovah. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. You know why you're not going to hell today? Because Jesus doesn't change. If he changed, and he told me yesterday, you're going to heaven. And he changed, today I could be going to hell. But if he told me yesterday, heaven's a guarantee for you and you can't go to hell, guess what the guarantee is today? Because he cannot change. That's why today you better rely upon Jesus Christ. Not the shifting sands of this world or religion or your own concept of who Jesus is, your idea of who he may be. No, friend, you better find out who he is from the word of God. Believe him, trust him, rely upon him, rest in him, and no one and nothing else because his nature is immutable. He cannot be changed. Religions change. Religions fluctuate. But Jesus never changes. He stays the same. Jesus the same. In fact, if this is true, that he never changes, think about all the little things that, I say little, all the major things. Let me rephrase that. All the major things that we find in the book of Hebrews about the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Hebrews 1, please. Think about this. If Jesus never changes, that means Jesus is the same in his sovereignty as he has always been. Look at Hebrews 1 in verse number 8. But unto the Son, that's Jesus Christ, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. If he was sovereign yesterday, he's sovereign today. If he was creator yesterday, he's creator today. If all things consist of him yesterday, they still consist of him today. He's holding this thing together. Now don't, 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 uh, don't worry about the news reports, and the environmentalists, and the climate change proponents. They're scared to death that this mud ball is going to fly apart one of these days because of us. The reason why I know that's not the case, by Jesus Christ, is everything held together. And he doesn't change. We may change, but 
Jesus holds it all together. He's sovereign today just as he has always been because he is immutable. He is changeless. We also see that he's the same in his separation as he has always been. Go to Hebrews 7. Look at Hebrews 7, verse 26. For such an high priest became us who is holy. Talking about Jesus, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Who neither not day listen, Jesus needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice. Remember, those, those Old Testament priests, they had to make a sacrifice for their own sins before they made a sacrifice for everybody else's sins. But the Bible says here that Jesus did not need a daily sacrifice as those high priests to offer up sacrifice for first his own sins and then for the people's for this he did once when he offered up himself when he offered up himself he knew no sin he was not cut off for himself he did not die for himself he died for sinners he died for you and I but God committed this love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for the ungodly he died for us but look at verse number 25 again, excuse me, 26. He's holy, he's harmless, he's undefiled, he's separate from sinners made higher than the heavens. Jesus is truly God and he's truly man. But even in his humanity, he is not just like you and I. The Bible says he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. That means when you looked at him and you were around him, you couldn't tell the difference between his flesh and our flesh, but in reality he knew no sin and you and I are corrupted by sin. That's why when Jesus died on the cross, he chose the point in which he died. Isn't it fascinating? Both of his hands were nailed to the cross. His feet was nailed to the cross. He could not use his hands or his feet to commit suicide. He could not kill himself. If he had hung himself or done something of that nature to die for our sins, that would have been a little suspicious. Because any old sinner can do that. But with his nails, excuse me, his hands and his feet nailed to the cross, he chose the point at which he would leave his body and take his last breath. He chose. You say, how did he have the power to choose? Because he knew no sin. And death had no control. Death could not get a hold of Jesus until Jesus let death get a hold of him. When he gave up the ghost. He died voluntarily. He died of his own volition when he wanted to die. You say, how is that? He knows no sin. He's not just like me and you. But everything that's wrong with us, that's what's right with him. That's why he is our Savior. His separation is as he has always been. We see Jesus Christ the same in his scriptures as he has always been. Go back to Hebrews chapter 1, please. Look at Hebrews 1. Look at verse number 5. Hebrews 1, verse 5. The Bible says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That is a quotation of Psalm 2, verse 7. Then he finished the verse, and again I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. That is 2 Samuel 7, 14. That is the word of the living God. Go, go to chapter 5. Go to chapter 5 of Hebrews, and look at verse number 5. So also Christ glorified on himself to be made a high priest, but he that said, said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. That's Psalm 2, 7 again. Verse 6, as he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest, thou art a priest, talking about Jesus, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's Psalm 110, verse number 4. Now go to Hebrews chapter 10. Go to Hebrews 10. Look at verse number 5. Hebrews 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast thou prepared me. 
In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. He's quoting Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. What do you say? What we're learning here in the Hebrews is the Bible is about Jesus Christ. That Old Testament was about Jesus Christ. When you read the Old Testament, don't look for you, don't look for this, don't look, look for Jesus Christ. It's all about Him. It's all about Him. It's all about Him. In fact, John 5, 39, Jesus said, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. I love Luke 24, verse 27. In that passage, Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus with those two disciples. And they're distraught. They're discouraged. They think all hope is gone. Three days ago, Jesus died on the cross. They thought he was the hope of Israel. Not realizing they're talking to the resurrected Christ. And the Bible says, in Luke 24, 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He started at Moses, and the Bible says there he went from Moses to the prophets. What that saying is, the Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi, he walked them through the Old Testament telling them about himself. Amen. You know why? Because from Genesis to Malachi, it's about him. Amen. It's about Jesus Christ. Jesus is the same in his sovereignty, in his separation, in his scriptures, in his strength. He is the same in his strength as he has always been. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, please. Hebrews 12. Look at verse number 1. Hebrews 12 verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. You say, what, what's that great cloud of witnesses? It's all of those saints of God he just mentioned in chapter 11. He just started with Abel and went all the way down to the other saints of God in the Old Testament and showing how they testified of faith in God and how faith always works. Faith pleases God. Faith is the best way. And we have this cloud of witnesses found in Hebrews 11 testifying of faith in God. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run, the, run, run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto who? Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, consider Jesus, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself when he was crucified, lest he be wearied, and faint in your minds. He's saying, if you'll get your eyes on Jesus, it'll give you strength. When we are faint and weary in our minds, he said, if you look to Jesus, he's the author of your faith. That means he got it started. And he's the finisher of your faith. He's going to go with you all the way to the end. If you look to Jesus. Saints of God have been looking to him for thousands of years. He's never let them down. He's always given strength. He will give you strength as well, child of God. His strength is great. His strength is powerful. In fact, when Paul was praying about that thorn in the flesh, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Jesus responded to Paul and said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength, is made perfect in weakness. If you're here today and you feel weak, ready to give up, ready to quit, you're done, you're finished, that may be where you're at. Now, I don't know who is, who, who is not. Y'all look fine to me. Y'all look like you're in a good state of mind to me. But maybe behind that smile, maybe behind that suit, maybe behind that dress, there's depression and discouragement and you're on the verge of giving up and walking away and quitting on God and the things of God, maybe a family and other things as well. I guarantee, I promise you today, you're looking 
to the wrong place with the wrong person because when you look to Jesus, he got your faith started. He'll finish it. And that same power that brought Jesus through the crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection is the same power that can help you today where you're at. And he's the same. He had that power yesterday. He has it today. And tomorrow he'll still have it. He is the same in his strength. He's the same in his supply. Look at chapter 13. Go back to chapter 13 again. Look at verse number 5. Let your conversation, that's your lifestyle, be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. In other words, why do we have an insatiable desire for more when Jesus is better than anything we'll obtain? Why do we live in covetousness? I need to have this, I need to have that, I need to have that. When Jesus is better than whatever you may get. You may get a bigger, bigger house, you may get a nicer car, you may have a, uh, more of a full bank account. You may get to go to all the vacations you want to go on. You may, you may get to retire at an early age and live the last years of your life in pleasure and fun. And Jesus is still better. Whatever you're pursuing that's not Jesus, Jesus is better. He's better. That's why he says, be content with what you've got because you've got the best thing. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. See, how, how many... How many people have retired? I don't try to scare anybody today, but how many people have retired and within a year or two? They left this world. I remember years ago, Joe Paterno was the football coach at Penn State for many, many, many years. And he coached till he was into his 80s. He was still a head coach in his 80s. And somebody asked him one day, said, why are you still coaching? In your 80s. You could have retired 20 years ago. You were a success. Why, did, why have you kept coaching in your 80s? He said, because one of my best friends, Bear Bryant, he retired early. He died within the year. He said, I don't want to do that, so I kept coaching. In other words, whatever you may obtain in this life, whether it's finances, family, a home, cars, money, vacations, entertainment, joy, the joy that this world offers. Whatever you obtain, you can lose it. You can lose it. It could all come crumbling down today. But if you've got Jesus, he will never leave thee nor forsake thee. If you lost everything that this world could possibly offer, you'll still have Jesus if you have Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His supply will always be there. Real quick, just two more and I'll be done. Jesus is the same in his succoring as he has always been. Go to Hebrews 2, please. Hebrews 2. Look at verse number 18. Maybe this will help somebody today. Look at verse 18. Last verse of Hebrews 2. For in that he himself, Jesus himself, hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. That word succor means to, it literally means to run to. It means to run to support. It means to run quickly to someone so that you can strengthen them and support them in the middle of a difficulty, assist them in a time of suffering. It means to quickly get to them and begin to strengthen them in their suffering. Well, the Bible says Jesus knows how to help you, succor you, to aid you, to relieve you in your suffering because he knows what you're going through. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible says, in verse number 14, seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, 
who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows what you are going through. I may not. There's been some of you, you've come to me, you, you, you've met with me or you've met with me and my wife and we've sat down and spoken to you and you're going through a trial. And there's been times, there's been times me and my wife have walked away from a counseling session and we walked away saying, I don't want to ever know what they're dealing with. We try to help, we pray, we counsel, but we'll, I, I walk away saying, I don't want to ever know what they're facing. And you would feel the same way. I don't want to know what they're going through. But Jesus knows what every one of us are going through. He's been there. He's been through it. In fact, he's helped other people going through what you're going through. He helped them. He'll help you. And he'll come quickly to your aid. He did it yesterday. He'll do it today. He'll do it again tomorrow. Even one more, and I promise you I'm done. Go to Hebrews chapter 2 again. Look at verse 10. Jesus is the same in his sovereignty, his separation, his scriptures, his strength, his supply, his suckering. And he is the same in his salvation as he has always been. Look at verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. In bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Jesus is called the captain of our salvation. Look at chapter 5, verse number 9. Chapter 5, verse 9. Just a couple of verses here. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. One more verse. Go to chapter 7. Look at verse 25. Wherefore he, Jesus, is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. That means when Jesus saves, he saves completely. I believe in a salvation that is real, that is complete, that you don't have to add anything to. Because Jesus saves to the uttermost. And maybe you're here today, and you're not saved. You've never truly placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe you're a Baptist, and you're just simply a professor in Christ. You've made a profession, but it's not held fast. It's not real. Maybe you're here today, you're not a professor, you're a full-blown rejecter of Jesus Christ could be somebody in this building. You know you've said no to Jesus Christ. You know that you've never placed your faith in him. You know that today you're lost. You know you're in your sin. And you know right now if you died without Christ, you'd go straight to hell. You know that. You don't have to stay that way. You don't have to leave that way. He was saving people yesterday. He's going to be saving people today. He's going to save some people tomorrow because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You don't have to die in your sins. From Adam and Eve, the first of creation, to the last people ever saved in the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ, everybody gets in the same way, by grace, through faith, through the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And what saved Adam and Eve saves the last one that will ever come to Christ and saves all of us right here in the middle. The same yesterday, today, and forever is Jesus Christ and His salvation will not change. Nobody yesterday got in by works. Nobody yesterday got in by any other way than Him. And you won't today. You get in. You'll get in by Jesus Christ and His salvation, His way, and only His way, and no other way. If you don't know Him, come to Him and trust Him.